Okay, so we're going to move on to a new concept today that kind of carries onwards with the whole discussion we had about radioactivity from last class. This, this concept is called half-life. Uh, now, it's not going to nearly be as in-depth today as it was yesterday, at least I certainly hope not. Um, but again, it's still very important. For those of you who are in Math 30 right now, you're going to be laughing during today because we already covered this in Math 30. But here it is again. Uh, in Physics 30, we got half-life. So we're going to look at how to mathematically predict the characteristics of radioactive decay today using the concept of half-life. We'll talk about the ways to express radioactive decay, uh, calculating decay using half-life, and we'll do a few examples. Shouldn't be too long, knock on wood. All right, so radioactive decay. The specific time at which a radioactive nucleus will decay is not known precisely. So when we looked at alpha, beta, and gamma decay yesterday, it's actually not known exactly when that will happen, right? It's kind of unpredictable. However, the statistical probability that, that it will decay is known, right? So in other words, the chance it will decay at any given moment uh, is actually known. Certain things will decay more frequently than others, so they'll have a higher probability of decaying at any moment than something else. Uh, and therefore, an accurate prediction of the decay rate of a large sample can be calculated. Therefore, we can calculate the amount of an isotope remaining after a specific amount of time based on its rate of decay. So again, even though we don't know exactly when, when each nucleus will decay, we can still predict uh, overall what the entire sample will look like after a given amount of time, right? All right, so expressing decay, the rate at which a radioactive sample transmutes, or in other words, decays, can be expressed in one of three ways. Uh, the first one is called a decay constant. This one isn't super common, but it's the probability of any given nucleus decaying in a unit of time. Each isotope has its own decay constant. So the higher the constant, the faster the, the isotope will decay. Decay constant is measured in seconds to the power of negative one, or in other words, one over seconds. Uh, so for example, radium-226 has a decay constant of 1.4 times 10 to the negative 11 uh, inverse seconds, or one over seconds. What that means is one uh, nucleus um, of radium-226, so if you have a whole sample of it, of you know, billions or trillions of nucleus, or nuclei, I should say, of radium-226, uh, one of them will decay every 1.4 times 10 to the negative 11 seconds, right? That's basically what that is saying with the seconds to the power of negative one, right? Uh, so in not very much time, like literally just like a trillionth or a quadrillionth or whatever of a second, uh, you'll see one of your uh, one of your nuclei of radium-226 decay. All right, another one is called the activity, also known as a, a decay rate. The number of nuclei in a sample that decay in a given unit of time, that's what the activity is. The unit is in this weird unit called Becquerel's, or BQ, uh, which really just means the number of decays per second. Uh, I don't believe you'll need this formula, but you might, you know, I don't wanna like eat my words too much. Activity is uh, the change in the number of radioactive nuclei divided by the change in time uh, minus the decay constant, uh, which is you know back in this piece right here, uh, times by the number of radioactive nuclei. So it is quite a, an excessive formula. Again, I don't know if you'll need to use it, but there it is just in case, uh, and it is measured in a unit called Becquerel's, which is the number of decays per second. So if you had something like, uh, I don't know, usually they're very, very high numbers, not gonna lie, but if you had something like 2000 BQ, that just tells you that 2,000 nuclei are going to decay every single second, right? So the higher number of Becquerels you have, uh, the faster that that thing is going to decay. Now those two are all well and good, that, that's fine, and they are used uh, relatively frequently, but in terms of the discussions we're gonna be having, we're more likely to use one called half-life. Now half-life is just the time required for half of the radioactive nuclei in a sample to decay. So in other words, if you had a half-life of 10 days, that would mean after 10 days you only have half of your sample of radioactive nuclei left over. Uh, so here's, here's an example. This is for cobalt-60. Uh, let's suppose you started with 10 grams, according to this here. So we had 100% of your cobalt initially, uh, and then the half-life of cobalt-60 is 5.27 years. So after one half-life, which is 5.27 years, you only have five grams of it left over, or in other words, 50%. Uh, after two half-lives, so after another half-life goes by, so another 5.27 years, you have half of that left over. So now you only have 2.5 grams, so 25% of what was originally uh, had, right? And then after another half-life, you have half of that left over, so 1.25 grams, so 12.5% of what you have left over, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, this is probably a more accurate depiction, or not accurate, I should say, a more uh, easier to understand depiction of how radioactive decay occurs, because again, it is all relative based on how many you have in your sample, 
right? It decays as a process, a slowing process, like a, like a, a decreasing um, exponential process uh, over time. All right, so the mathematical formula for the decay of a radioactive substance is given by the fo following equation, n equals n0 times 1 half to the power of lowercase n. Uh, just to break down this formula, capital N is the number of radioactive nuclei left. So it's just like how much you actually have left over. N0 is your initial number of nuclei. Uh, little n here is the number of times that the half-life passes. I don't like this. This is how it appears on your formula sheet. I don't like this. It's better uh, listed uh, how we did it in Math 30. Uh, for those of you in Math 30 right now, uh, this little n up here, the number of times, is just your elapsed time divided by your half-life, right? So in other words, if your half-life was five years and your elapsed time was 10 years, well, then it's 10 divided by five. In other words, it's done this two times, right? Because in 10 years, two half-lives have gone by. So 10 divided by five is two. I like that a lot better, um, whatever floats your boat though. But that formula is on your formula sheet, not this part right here, but this thing up here certainly is. Just know that this lowercase n is the number of times that your half-life passes. So your elapsed time divided by your half-life, okay? Half-life, again, is denoted by T one half. That is a T, doesn't look like one. There we go, that's better, T one half, right? Um, don't know what else I was gonna say about this one. Not, not too much, I guess. I guess the other thing I could mention is, uh, yeah, it says the number of nuclei left over. Uh, don't get too carried away with that. It could also be just your, your mass as well. So it was this many kilograms you had at the end, uh, and this is the number of kilograms you had initially. That's fine too. It's all, it's all uh, relative, it all works in scale with each other. Uh, it's just fine. Okay, uh, now the fraction of an isotope remaining after a given time is given by this. It's just n is equal to one half to the power of lowercase n. Basically, this is just where you said your n zero was one or 100%, right? Your initial amount was 100%. Uh, so in other words, the one would be right there. Uh, and your final amount is that, right? As a decimal, right? It's just the fraction of how much is remaining is left over. That's how it is. This is not on your formula sheet. We might use it every now and then, uh, just so you know. But again, if you're saying, oh, how much is left over? or What percentage is left over? Just set your initial amount, n0 to one or 100%, okay? That's how that's done. Uh, graphing radioactive decay, we've already seen that on that example I gave a little earlier. Uh, the graph of the mass or activity of a sample as a function of time will be a curved graph and can be used to determine the half-life of a sample. Um, so if we looked at this example, for instance, notice we have time along our x-axis and our mass remaining in milligrams along our y-axis. Uh, initially at a time of zero, we have 50 milligrams. Uh, and then notice at this point right here, we had 25 milligrams. That's half of what we started with after 1.0 minutes. So in other words, our half-life, T1 half, is literally one minute on this one, okay? So you can interpret it that way. Or you could start here. You say, all right, one minute we had 25, and then down here we had 12.5 uh, milligrams. That's half of 25, so that's half of what we had there. Oh, look, it was another one minute that, that passed, right? So it was another elapsed time of one minute, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. All right, so let's do some examples here. Tritium, which I know we've talked about before. It's just an isotope of hydrogen. Uh, it glows, right? So they use it in like watches and stuff. Uh, it has a half-life of about 12.3 years. How much of a 200 milligram sample will be left after 5.0 years? So 5.0 years, this is your elapsed time. Okay, that's your time. 12.3 years, that's your half-life. Uh, if we look at our formula, remember N is equal to N0 times one half to the power of little n, uh, and I hate this formula. I wish instead of little n, they would just give it to you. Little n is your time, like your elapsed time, divided by your half-life, okay? Let's list out what we got. We know we initially started with 200 milligrams, so we know n0 is 200 milligrams. Notice how you don't have to turn it into the number of nuclei. You can literally just use your mass, it's fine. Uh, n is what we're looking for, like capital N is what we're looking for, that's how much is left over. Uh, uh, elapsed time here is five, years and our half-life is 12.3 years. Just remember that lowercase n in this formula is your elapsed time divided by your half-life. So if we're gonna throw this all together all in one, we can say n is equal to 200 times one half to the power of five divided by 12.3. Throw this in your calculator. Be very careful to make sure that this exponent, first of all, maybe put brackets around the exponent as well to make sure it's all in one. Uh, and also make sure the exponent only goes on the one half. Bottom line here is we're going to get uh, 151 milligrams. We rounded it to the nearest whole milligram. Uh, so there you go. And that makes sense because remember half of 200 would be 100 milligrams. 
Uh, so you have 100 milligrams left over after 12.3 years. We're nowhere close to 12.3 years. We're only at 5.0 years. Uh, so we're not going to make it down that low yet, but that's how much we would have left over at that point. All right, next one. Radon 222 has a half-life of 3.82 days. What percent of a sample of this isotope will remain after 2.0 weeks? Okay, so very mild curveball here. They gave you days and then they gave you weeks. Those aren't like those, those units don't interact well with each other. So let's turn two weeks into days. That's exactly 14 days. Not a big surprise, right? Uh, so we know the half-life. That's T one half. We know the elapsed time is T. We're looking for the percentage of a sample that would remain after two weeks. So we're looking for N. When it's asking for a percent, it's probably best just to say that your initial amount is 100. You could also say it's equal to one if you're more comfortable with decimals. I'll put it as 100. Though. So the initial amount is 100%. We're looking for the final amount. So n is equal to n, zero, times one half to the power of little n, where little n is time divided by your half-life, right? Uh, so throwing these numbers in, we have n is equal to 100% times one half to the power of your lapse time, which is 14 days, divided by your half-life, which is only 3.82. Um, I guess if we throw this right in your calculator all in one go, I'll just round, uh, I guess we'll round to two sig digs here, because that's all it gave us. Um, it's going to be 7.9, and I guess since it's 7.9, we'll say it's 7.9%. So 7.9% is what's left over uh, after two weeks. Now, the reason I threw this picture in here, uh, and it's something that a lot of people, like people just don't seem to talk about this very often. Uh, it's not a huge concern in Southern Alberta, but I know in certain parts of the world, uh, like even Saskatchewan, of all things, it can be a bigger, a bigger concern. Um, but uh, radon, radon-222, is actually a naturally occurring uh, radioactive element that exists actually in the crust of the earth uh, and it's kind of scattered all around earth's crust it's located in patches here and there so certain places have it worse than others um, but basically what happens is radon can actually be released from the soil now a normal amount of radon of course like when you're outside is actually being uh, released as a gas out of the ground uh, quite frequently and it makes up a, a reasonable portion of the air that we breathe in the only difference is though it's so diluted with the air in the rest of the atmosphere uh, that it doesn't matter However, what can actually pose a problem is radon can find its way into people's homes. And then once it gets into a home, the home actually kind of acts as a barrier, so it kind of like increases in concentration. Uh, now, radon is radioactive, uh, so it can emit some radiation over time, uh, which can be damaging. And also, uh, radon itself is a little bit toxic uh, to breathe in. Uh, so just as you're living in a house over time that has radon that's leaking into it, there can be some longstanding health effects that come from this. Uh, now, radon, of course, that there's many ways you can prevent radon from coming to your house. There's actually industries uh, that focus on removing radon from people's homes. Um, but this is actually one of the main reasons why it's so important to seal any cracks that exist in the foundation of your home uh, and also make sure windows uh, that are kind of right at ground level are also sealed. Um, but then the scary thing is that it can also enter through the water supply into your home, which is really, really comforting uh, to know that we can have some radioactive gas uh, entering our homes in very, very small quantities, but albeit uh, enough. Uh, if you look into it, there's actually like radon removal technologies. So some homes in areas where radon is a more serious concern are actually built with these like certain mechanisms to, to pump radon out of the home. Uh, but we won't get into that. Kind of just like the more you know, though. Uh, kind of freaky when you think of it. Anyway, we're done for today. I told you it was going to be a quick lesson. Uh, atomic physics assignment, you probably want to work on that. Uh, but aside from that, make sure you're trying some of the questions in the Half-Life Worksheet, which is on page 48 to 51. Uh, and you guys know the drill. As always, make sure you're reaching out to me if you need any help.